Enjoy the convenience of seven days a week banking and extended hours with Cube from First Arkansas Bank and Trust. Member FDIC. It's time for From the Short Grass with Trey Shap, a golf podcast for those who love golf, struggle with golf, and just like to enjoy the outdoors and fellowship with friends, all while chasing a ball around trying to put it in a four and a quarter inch diameter hole. From the Short Grass is brought to you by Blackman Auctions. For over 80 years, better auctions have always been Blackman Auctions. By MinnowsPlus.com. From baits to waiters, if it helps you catch a fish, they have it. And now, from the short grass, here is your host, Trey Shap. Welcome to another edition of From the Short Grass. I am your host, Trey Shap. Well, we've had our first freeze. The weather is definitely getting cooler. Daylight is getting shorter. And the amount of time that you have to play golf is definitely decreasing this time of the year. With that being said, it's time for basketball season. I couldn't have thought of a better way to bring on basketball season than sitting down with a national champion basketball coach who also happens to love the game of golf. In this episode, part one of my sit down with Nolan Richardson, head coach of the 1994 Arkansas Razorback National Championship basketball team. I know you're going to enjoy this. And we have future basketball coaches coming up in episodes as well, both from the men's game and the women's game. I want to tell you about Minnows Plus. MinnowsPlus.com. They have the Reveal Cellular Camera by TactCam. Right now, you can get it at MinnowsPlus.com. After a short break, we're back with Nolan Richardson. This is Thomas Blackman of Blackman Auctions. Trey asked me to sponsor a show for another few months. Even though I don't like golf, I do like his show. I have no idea how he gets the awesome variety of guests on his show, but it is entertaining and informative even for a horrible golfer like myself. I'm learning a lot about the game and about the passion for playing. So much so, I've started using my country club for more than Sunday brunch. Trey makes golf interesting. I make auctions interesting. For auctions, listen to me. For golf, listen to Trey. Since 1938, better auctions are Blackman Auctions. Minnows Plus is your local source for live bait and live well supplies. They carry the entire line of SureLife products, everything from better bait and finer shiner to no ammonia products to keep your bait and your catch thriving till you get back to the dock. They are the best source for all your private land ponds. Minnows Plus has fish food and pond fertilizer to keep your pond healthy and thriving all year long. If you own or run a bait and tackle shop and need to resupply, contact Minnows Plus and ask about their wholesale prices. Open to the public and walk-ins are welcome. Find them on the web at MinnowsPlus.com. On the tee, 1994 National Championship head basketball coach of the Arkansas Razorbacks, Nolan Richardson. Coach, thanks so much for joining us on From the Short Grass, a, a golf podcast. And I know you love the game of golf. Maybe not as much as you love basketball, no. but maybe. If I had to do it all over again, golf would be the most intriguing sport that I, I could have played. You know, and I wasn't real smart because in my neighborhood, I lived in a neighborhood where there was a bunch of Hispanic and we were the only black family. And most all of my friends were caddies. And I never forget, they, they talked me into going to caddy one day. And when I got through walking nine holes, I kept walking, going home. Because it was so hot and you carrying a bag and the bag was heavy. And I said, no, I, n- I never ever tried to play golf until I turned about 21, 22 years of age. So later, later in life, did you decide to start playing? What triggered that? It was a bit. Uh, I used to, as I was working to finish my degree, I worked for Orkin Exterminating Company. And so I was exterminating the TV station and the guy that used to cover all my co- college games made me a bet. He says, you know, you play all the sports, but I bet you can't hit a golf ball. And I said, hey, anybody can hit a golf ball. It it doesn't move. I said, you know, I play baseball. I'm bat really good. I can shoot the ball, basketball. You, all the balls you throw, I can catch the football. And everything. I said, you guys got a ball that sits there, and all you got to do is swing at it. Give me a break. The, the bet was five bucks, and back in those days, five dollars was a lot of money. And so I, I took him up on it. And I went out to the driving range, not too far from where this place was. And I'd I'd passed this place so many times, I never even looked over there. Well, we go over there, 
and I can't hit it. No way. I I could not hit the golf ball. But I was left-handed, so I had uh, an excuse. I told the guy, I said, well, wait till you get some left-hand clubs. They didn't, they didn't seem to make those in those days. Right. So I l- start playing right-handed. So what I did was go out every day for 25 cents and get a bucket of balls until I learned how to hit the ball. And the pro would, would give me lessons. I made that bet again, double or nothing. You won that bet. I won that bet big time. <laughs> but you know the funny part about it is I was getting lessons. The guy that I was playing against, who was the president and the vice president of the com- of, of the TV station, he was paying the pro for the lessons. Oh, wow. So <laughs> <laughs> he wanted you to succeed. <laughs> I'll never forget that. How Sheldon about that? Turner. Sheldon so, Turner. And he did say something that to this day it sticks with me. He says, you know what, Nolan, you learn to play this game, you'll have more fun than you've ever had with anything you've ever done. And guess what? You can play it until you're 100 years old if you still can get up and down and walk. Well, was he right? Absolutely. I, I met so many wonderful people. You know, it, it's amazing to me that people on the golf course may be totally different than that person who leaves the golf course. It's amazing what I see. You know, the game is so humbling. You think one day you've got it, this, this is it, I, I've, I've mastered what I need, and it, it's gone. It, it's, it's such an elusive game. You can't run harder. You can't hustle. You can't do anything to make up for what you're not doing, you know. And so it, it just becomes a, a, a nightmare. <laughs> you don't have to run many Cleveland Hills to become a golfer. Oh, that's for, that's for sure. <laughs> but, you know, I had a chance to play with Lee Trevino growing up a little bit. He was down there in El Paso. The Mary Mex. That's the guy, you know. And I never will forget, he used to run. And most, most guys didn't run. You know, they just played and practiced. And I remember at the little country club that he was uh, working at, he'd go out and, and jog the golf course. Uh, that was the first time I said, hey, th- this is a sports for athletes. And believe me, today you can see it. I use quotes at the end of each podcast from famous golfers. In episode four, when I sat down with Houston Nutt, I used a quote from Lee Trevino. The putts get much harder to make the day they start handing out the money. Absolutely. When that happens, it's kind of like he would always say that, you know, I was playing this guy, Nolan. He was bigger than you, much bigger, broad guy. Could play, he says. And, and they asked me if I had pressure playing him. He says, of course I had pressure. When you plan a guy who's bigger, stronger, and can play as well or better, and you don't have five bucks. That's right. Now, that's pressure. That's right. When, when, <laughs> when you've made a bet and you don't have enough of it in your pocket to cover that bet, that's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of pressure. So Tell me about this picture back here with you and you're almost dressed close to what Payne Stewart would dress like except that you're not true knickers but you've got a basketball and a putter on a green well those guys that took the picture are the ones that thought of this idea let's let's put a basketball which is what you are and this is your golf tournament uh we used to have the that tournament was held at the pinnacle okay and uh I would invite the top coaches in the country to come to this tournament. It would be 36 different, you know, guys who could play. So who were some of those coaches? Well, you know, we had Roy Williams was a a very good uh, player. Uh, Rick Pitino came in. He's not really a a good golf player. But uh, uh, Tarkanian. Tark the Shark. Tark the Shark. You get him around telling stories uh, at nights. And it was a three-day affair, you know. uh, Billy Tubbs. Oh, yeah. You know, and he, you know, some of these guys are gone now. Raleigh Massimino from Villanova, you know. You just named the school, and I can say, yeah, they were here. Yeah. Matter of fact, it, it was done so well that ESPN carried it. Uh, we did nine holes on ESPN. It was a tremendous golf tournament. Mr. Tyson has built a phenomenal golf course, not too far from where we are right now, up here where not you live. The absolutely. blessings. The blessings is it's scary. You know, I've, I've been out there a few times, and it's just so tough to play. You know, uh, you, especially if you're playing not the back or the middle tees. I mean, I could play all the way up to the front now and and still have to use another drive on my second shot part. But it, it, it's it's demanding. You know, there's, there's no uh, – can't get away with a bad shot. Right. No. Now, when you were coaching up here – 
um, if memory serves me correct, you played out at Paradise Valley quite a bit. You had your own golf cart, the red golf cart with the hogs on the side of it. Everybody knew <laughs> when Coach Richardson was out there playing. Well, I lived on the second hole. Uh, I started a little out. short par three. A par three. Yeah, I used to sometimes come right out. And I knew that par three better. That's the only hole I could par most of the time. Because <laughs> <laughs> you played, played it so many played times. It every day. And it was something that didn't bother me then. When I get in a tournament, I couldn't, I couldn't get a par. Oh my I mean, gosh. that's that's what I th- say about golf. You know, is I get a kick out of these guys that miss that that say, "How could he miss a three foot putt?" I says, it's "Very easy. Just stand over it and hit it. <laughs> if you don't hit it right, it ain't going in. So you can miss a three foot putt just like you can make a a, a thirty foot putt. You know, this flag over here, Nolan Richardson, John Daly Charity Golf Tournament. When when did you team up with with Big John? Big John came to my rescue uh, many years ago. I mean, he was – John, I used to play with him. He used to pass – it's an amazing little story. He passed through the house on the second hole, and he yelled, Coach, you know, because I could – I'm going to play him, but he's going to win the money because, you know, anytime he needed lunch money, he'd come by and say, Hey, Coach, you want to play a little bit? <laughs> One day he came through there, and, he, and this is a, kind of the embarrassing part. He comes through, and he's yelling at me. I could hear him. My wife goes and says, there's a, there's a kid out there calling you, and it's John. And, and, and then he says, Miss Rose, yeah. Can coach come out and play? <laughs> like, <laughs> he had to go ask <laughs> your wife for permission for you to come out and play. Yeah, it was funny, boy. So anyway, we, uh, I, did, I lived there and, and had a chance to play quite a bit of golf during the time that I lived there. I still go out and play. Uh, I used to play quite a bit, but since COVID and since my wife got sick – I haven't really played much golf in the last two years. Did you play much with Paul Eels back in the day? I played a few times with Paul. You know, uh, th- there's a guy that loved the game. Yes, he did. You know, uh, there's a guy that loved life. I don't think I've ever met a person that was so sincere and so seemed like it. He, he didn't. He didn't. It didn't matter to him who you are and what you were. You were a human being, and he treated you like that. Uh, he, I can never say enough wonderful things about Paul because we spent quite a few years together uh, doing my uh, sh- radio show, mm. TV shows. He called a lot of your games. Man, uh, most well, all of my career he was with us. And, uh, and, of course, I got a chance to be around for about 17 years. And he was there, all 17 of them, I believe. When you think back, is, is there one player that you think would, would be good at golf in all of the places you've been, whether it be Arkansas, Tulsa? or You know, when I, when I saw Big O came to El Paso and, and played some golf, and I was surprised. He Big O? Big O. Pretty good player. Todd Day. They, they came down. Uh, pretty good player. Their scores, I don't know about how they tell the scores because some of the guys who played with them said, uh, <laughs> Coach, they were giving themselves 90 footers. <laughs> 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 they said, oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> good. Pick it up. Pick it up. What about so, Corliss? I don't, you know, Corliss, I, I, you know, he never uh, struck me as a guy that would want to play any golf. He, he, he was just like I was, you know, thinking that the game probably, it's a little bit different now. It's, it's a harder game than they think. I'm sure you've seen Charles Barkley. Oh, I played I played with him. Oh, boy, tell me that story. You had to have taken money off of him. <laughs> Everybody did. <laughs> well, he's a guy, and, and I think Michael Jordan tells the story best. Charles Barkley is a guy that loves the game of golf and loves to gamble, and he's very bad at golf, but he loves to gamble. He knows he's bad at golf, but he can't resist betting on the golf course. Well, that's that, that's who he is, you know. Charles, Char- I got a chance to coach Charles when he was a freshman at Auburn. That year, they had what they call the uh, Junior Type Olympic, and I had the South team, and he was on that team. He was just a little fat, round amount of greyhound, a bomb. Yeah. And I never forget when he came in, he was late, but I didn't know who he was, and the assistant coach was from that area, so I said, "Who's this kid?" He said, that's Charles Barkley. You know, I, I, I was the coach at, at Tulsa University in the Missouri Valley. I, kept, I didn't keep up with that Southeast Conference. 
So he says, you don't know him, coach? I said, no, I never heard of him. He says, you will. Well, we went to pr practice that day. And I said, uh, before we went to practice, I said, why are you late? He said, uh, uh, they got caught in the traffic and the buses and, and the tr plane. I said, go ahead, just get dressed. And we're going to be working out here in an hour. And he, he true enough, he showed up. And the first play uh, that the ball, they just bounced it and threw it up. And he goes up and do almost a 360 dunk in it. And I said, how did that little fat guy get off the ground? <laughs> that was just to show that, hey, I'm here, fellas. And everybody, everybody knew him. And then when we went up and down, he could outrun everybody just about. Wow. I said, man, what a talent. He was a freshman. He had just finished his freshman year. And so uh, that was the first time. And then after that, uh, when he got to be as popular with the NBA, we were able to go to these golf tournaments, and that's why I got a chance to play with him from time to time. He's worked on his swing a lot. He's oh, had man. people try to help him with his swing, and I think it has gotten a little bit better. But, Coach, he would take it back, and he would get that hitch, and he couldn't, Could he couldn't come down. He couldn't come down. I, yes, I know what you're saying. I told him, I said, you know what, Charles, I could correct that if you let me, but I know you won't. I said, you know – on the left side of your brain, and you got a right side. I said, switch. Switch hands. Go left-handed. Because the right side <laughs> of the brain is paralyzed, Hoss. <laughs> what did he say? He looked at me and said, oh, coach, ain't nothing going to fix this. I'm going I'm to continue to do this. But I would have tried. I would have gone left-handed because he, he couldn't come. You know, he'd get to the point whoop, and he just couldn't finish it. That's right. But maybe from the left side, you know, the, the game is, t is muscle memory, muscle, muscle memory. So if that side doesn't remember anything yet, and I says, and so, you know, it's kind of like uh, I told one of the kids that I was coaching in that deal. He, he, I said, you know, if, if I put a bird's brain in, into your brain, you'd fly backwards. <laughs> that's true <laughs> but anyway i uh, uh charles is, is 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 a unique individual he really is i i really have a great uh great admiration for charlie uh, you know he he's kind of outspoken very he says what's on his mind he leaves no doubt to who how he feels about what he feels about you know there's no doubt but coach i think that's what makes him him and then the show that he's on after the NBA games, inside the NBA on TNT with Ernie Johnson, you know, trying to spearhead and, and control everything. And you've got Charlie. Shaquille O'Neal over on the right. And you've got Kenny, the Jim Kenny. Smith Kenny. right there to the left of EJ and then, and then Chuck on the end. What a group. What you know, a group. Yeah, they, they, they bring a lot of, inter you know, interesting uh, scenarios that the average fan – that just watch wouldn't really understand. They, I think they helped them understand the pro game a lot better. They are one of a kind. I'm sure you've played some of the best courses in the country. I played a few, but I had my greatest opportunity. I was uh, played uh, Augusta. I never forget. We we got there about one o'clock. When was this? This was '94, right after the national championship. I got. Uh, uh, Mr. Stevens and Frank Bros and of course he at the time Mr. Stevens was the president. He was yeah. That was one of the deals that I was able to to receive, and uh, I, I can't remember the guy I flew up with, but we we spent uh, we went straight to the golf course, put on our shoes, and right out on the right out there on the golf course we played until the until it got dust dark, couldn't see no more. Got up the next morning, and played another maybe. 20 holes, and then we caught our plane and came back. So I had the opportunity to play there. How was it? The rough, i never forget, the rough was better than our, our fairways. The rough was so beautiful. I'm saying, man, I don't mind landing in the rough side here. And, and, and it's kind of an open course kind of. I think it's changed quite a bit since 94, 95. Sure, it has. But uh, I, I know one time I hit one, and it either duck hooked one or uh, fade which caused a, a wild slice for me. But I still could could hit. Usually when I did that, uh, usually I'm behind trees and land. But you could almost see where you hit the back golf ball. Mm -hmm. 
The thing that was really uh, amazing is the putting surface. I think from probably from tee to green, most of those guys are good, but when you hit that green, boy, if you ain't got the right read on it, no telling what might happen or the right speed or the right. That, that ran me crazy. One time, I, I think it was four or five putts that I had to take. Wow. Yeah. Had an elephant back look like it. Every time, it either, either it's going to go or it's coming back at me, you know, I'm saying. And then there was one, one of the holes that the caddy told me, you're going to hit it that way. And the hole was here, back. He said, but you want to hit it this way, and it, it, it'll come back. So I did said, you do no. that? No. I faced a hole in here. And so he, he said, look at this. He threw the ball, and it just <laughs> came right back down to the hole, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> 94 national champions, and then you get to go to Augusta. I mean, that just had to be a treat. When did you first start watching golf on television? I, I watched golf any chance I could get because once I turned 21, 22 years of age and made that bet, I became big-time golfer because once I got out of the college, I went into the high school. I was the golf coach. They didn't have any golf, and I was probably the only person on that campus that played golf a little bit, so they made me the golf coach. And then the girls didn't have a team, so I got the girls included. So I had boys and girls golf after the basketball season. I just sent them out, go hit some balls or do something while I coached the basketball. And then when I got through with basketball, I'd go to golf, which was right up my alley because I got a chance to play. Of every course. Day, every day I got a chance to play until it was over. This might shock you. I'm a graduate of Parkview High School where Scotty Thurman is the head coach now. Charles Ripley was the coach. I remember him. I graduated in 94. Guess who was my golf coach? Ripley? Charles Ripley. Yeah. He was the golf coach. Is that right? Never played a lick of golf in his life, but he was the golf he coach. He was the golf coach. How about that? <laughs> a, I, I tell you, it's amazing. I mean, I couldn't beat the guys who could shoot 100 on, on the golf team because <laughs> most of those kids, have, some of them played a little bit. You know? Right. We were so poor that I had a lot of buddies out at the golf course. They, I would take their clubs that they would, didn't need or didn't and just make me a, 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 a small bag for you had to have at least five on your team. That's how we survived the first three years of me getting wow. clubs from anywhere. Uh, everybody say, oh, Nolan's got a golf team. Y'all got some balls? You got, yeah, that's how we pieced it together. Then the school came out and said, we're going to support golf. And so they bought us clubs and balls. This is Thomas Blackman of Blackman Auctions. Trey asked me to sponsor a show for another few months. Even though I don't like golf, I do like his show. I have no idea how he gets the awesome variety of guests on his show, but it is entertaining and informative even for a horrible golfer like myself. I'm learning a lot about the game and about the passion for playing. So much so, I've started using my country club for more than Sunday brunch. Trey makes golf interesting. I make auctions interesting. For auctions, listen to me. For golf, listen to Trey. Since 1938, better auctions are Blackman Auctions. Minnows Plus is your local source for live bait and live well supplies. They carry the entire line of SureLife products, everything from better bait and finer shiner to no ammonia products to keep your bait and your catch thriving till you get back to the dock. They are the best source for all your private land ponds. Minnows Plus has fish food and pond fertilizer to keep your pond healthy and thriving all year long. If you own or run a bait and tackle shop and need to resupply, contact Minnows Plus and ask about their wholesale prices. Open to the public and walk-ins are welcome. Find them on the web at MinnowsPlus.com. Welcome back to From the Short Grass. Do you like auctions? Do you like farm auctions? Blackman Auctions is going to host the ABCD Farms LLC Equipment Auction in Boonville, Arkansas on December the 2nd. Farm equipment, construction equipment, trucks, trailers, and lots of shop and support equipment is going to be auctioned off. Find it on the web, blackmanauctions.com. Since 1938, better auctions have always been Blackman Auctions. On the tee, it's our weekly rule segment with PGA Master Professional Adam Carney. Adam, Robert Gomez, earlier this year, failed to sign his scorecard. I think I'd be in the same boat with him after what he did. He shot a 20 over 92, and so he just didn't want to sign the scorecard. This comes in from Jack in Fayetteville via from the short grass at gmail.com. So what happens when a player playing in a tournament just bypasses the scorer's tent and decides I'm not going to sign the scorecard? That's pretty simple. 
I mean, player responsibilities. You're you're required to make sure there there are two signatures on that card. One is you is the competitor, and one is the whoever was your marker. And I, he, yeah, I don't, I, I get you. I mean, I'd be happy shooting 92 right now, frankly. But <laughs> it's just one of those deals. It's you know, he, he's angry and he's he's ready to go home and just I'm out of here. And you never know what's going on in his life that day. But right. he just said I'm out of here and he's disqualified for it. So. It's a good opportunity, I think, to talk about player responsibilities. Um, I think often. Well, he also has to sign the card that he kept too. Correct. And I'm did he did he? Sign I believe that he card? did. He he signed he and signed his it fellow to competitor's his competitor. card. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you know, and there are there are situations that deal with that where the player that is the marker doesn't sign and he's not around. Um, there's a whole litany of things that you can go through to attest the card. Uh, somebody else in the group you can you know there, there's all kinds of things they can do and the player is not going to be disqualified because his marker didn't sign the score and you can't find him there, there are ways to handle that but it's a good opportunity to talk about player responsibilities because I think oftentimes what we see at every level of the game is so much responsibility being heaped on the committee and or rules officials and the players have to have some you know they have to be responsible for their actions. We can't go back and look and say, okay, what happened every single time? Because mm -hmm. we're not there every single time. Right. Um, as a club professional, I mean, you might be out on the golf course, but it could happen on the other side. You could be in in the clubhouse getting score sheets put up or something. Else. I mean, you can't be there. So the players do hold a certain level of responsibilities, and they're they're well illustrated in the rules of golf. And so, if a player doesn't sign a scorecard, it's his responsibility. And you know, Robert Gomez probably knew the the result of what was going to happen. And I've met Robert several times, and Robert's a really nice guy. But you know, as a PGA Tour player, if he shot 92, I'd probably be as distraught as he was and just hit the road. The player is responsible for his competitor score. That competitor is responsible for a player's score their job is to make sure the hole by hole is correct correct the committee does all of the addition that's correct as a competitor my only responsibility is that the 18 boxes that have numbers in them are accurate for the number of strokes that i took on each one of those holes that is my sole responsibility and as a marker for someone else it's to record theirs and sign their scorecard they are then responsible for the hole by hole accuracy thankfully you don't have to be a mathematician you don't have to add as long as your 18 holes are correct you've done your job as as in when you return that scorecard so that is a player responsibility and it's probably the the most ex important one when you're returning your scorecard is to make sure of the accuracy of the the numbers in those 18 boxes that they they match what you actually made on those holes Let's say that they do match what you made on those holes. Mm -hmm. You leave the scoring area, scores are posted, you come back the next day for the second round of the tournament, and you notice that, okay, I didn't shoot a 70 yesterday. I shot a 71, but they had me down for a 70. Mm -hmm. But I know my hole by hole was correct when I turned it in. What happens then? Well, there's a, a lot of things that can happen. I mean, so the, the first question to the committee is, I shot 71. Why do I have 70 up there? Hopefully, the committee made a math error. They then correct it to, to 71. If you check the hole by hole and the hole by hole was absolutely correct then it would stand to reason the only the only answer to that could be a math error by the committee but if you sign your card and your hole by hole was not correct so on number 17 that you made a five and and it's a four on your scorecard now you've got a different situation you've signed the wrong scorecard and you're not playing the next correct. day either Correct. He's Adam Carney. I'm sure Robert Gomez trunk slammed his way out of that tournament uh, when he, sure he did, did not sign his scorecard. He's with us every week. If you've got a question about the rules of golf, like Jack and Fayetteville did there, email us at fromtheshortgrass at gmail.com. That will do it for this edition of From the Short Grass. Don't forget, part two of my sit-down interview with Nolan Richardson will come your way in our next episode. I leave you with this golf quote from Greg Norman. Happiness is a long walk with a putter. I hope you enjoy your next round on the course, and when you find your ball mark on the green, fix it and a couple of more. And I hope to see you from the short grass. You've been listening to From the Short Grass, a weekly podcast dedicated to the game of golf. From the Short Grass is brought to you by MinnowsPlus.com and Blackman Auctions. This has been a presentation of the Buzz Radio Network.